Hi everyone, I'm Michael Short. This is Let's Go Outdoors. Let's go outdoors where the waters run clear and cold. Mother Nature's world is better than gold. So much to see, so much to do. Let's go outdoors, me and you. Let's go outdoors. Let's Go Outdoors with Michael Short. Supported by the Alberta Conservation Association. Conserving Alberta's wild side. Hi everyone, welcome to Let's Go Outdoors. I'm Michael Short. Coming up, we head down to southern Alberta to welcome back the sage grouse. The long weekend is fast approaching. We take a look at some images and behavior we hope won't repeat itself. Just how many moose are living in Alberta? Well, there's an app for that. Provincial Hunting Day is something many of us look forward to. We catch up with a number of families who celebrate this day at Alfred Lake. And a little later on, my co-host Alma will join me in studio for a look back and a look ahead to another season of Let's Go Outdoors. If some kind of action wasn't taken, this might be the only way we could look at a sage grouse. Biologists with Alberta Sustainable Resource Development are attempting to bring back this rare bird. Contained in these boxes are Alberta's newest residents, the greater sage grouse. At one time, these birds were plentiful here in the southeast corner of our province. Over the past 40 years, a number of factors have contributed to the decline of the sage grouse, including farming, ranching, and oil and gas development. Now listed as a critically endangered species, sage grouse numbers in Alberta plummeted to just 13 males last year. In an attempt to pop up population numbers, Alberta Sustainable Resource Development has embarked on a four-year study to bring in sage grouse from Montana. It's estimated Montana's grouse population is in the area of 70,000 birds. To capture these birds is no easy task. The operation takes place at night as the bright lights freeze the birds just long enough to get a net over them. Nice work. Before they can cross the border, each bird is examined by a vet, both on the American side and again by a Canadian veterinarian. Each bird is fitted with a radio transmitter so that their movements can be tracked. This is critical in providing biologists with information on the type of habitat they're settling into. In order to allow these birds an opportunity to adjust to their new surroundings, biologists set up blinds close to a lek. We've chosen a couple of lek sites here in the southeast corner of the province to release the birds on and uh, when we're choosing a uh, suitable release location, uh, what we're looking for is a lek that is in good quality intact habitat that hasn't been uh, significantly impacted or degraded by incompatible land use activities. For example, the percentage of oil and gas activities in the area, the amount of farmland in the area and those sorts of things that uh, reduce the quality of the habitat from a sage grouse perspective. Of course, another reason to release these birds close to these strutting males is to encourage breeding. The hens are attending the leks, and so throughout the next uh, couple of weeks, those hens will get bred and, and fly off and, and start laying eggs over the following weeks and then uh, incubate those eggs for about 30 days and uh, hopefully uh, raise a brood of chicks to uh, help uh, recruit more young sage grouse into uh, our population and support our recovery. In order to give these birds a chance at surviving, new regulations protecting habitat have been brought into play, which include large buffers around known lek sites and managing up to 80,000 acres of sage grouse habitat. Throughout the process, partnerships with various conservation organizations is also playing an important role. There are some agencies, Alberta Conservation Association, the Alberta Fish and Game Association, Pheasants Forever, Nature Conservancy, Grassland Naturalists, uh, who are also supporting the, the uh, sage grouse recovery by uh, purchasing land and uh, restoring land, restoring the habitat to uh, something that uh, would benefit the sage grouse. 
Here's hoping that new land management practices and protecting habitat will be enough to give the sage grouse a chance to reclaim this part of Alberta that they once thrived in. The May long weekend signals for a lot of us the return to our favorite campsite. There are, however, some who see our wilderness areas as nothing more than their personal space and treat it as such. Welcome to the May long weekend. You would expect this sort of mess when walking into a tornado zone, not along a secondary highway in Alberta's backcountry. Yet it seems this is how some folks take advantage of spending time in our outdoors. There are many adjectives one can come up with to describe this behavior, but I'll let the pictures speak for themselves. Now, this story was filmed a year ago, and I'm told by Conservation Officer Miles Jensen that the situation has improved over the years. One can just imagine what it may have looked like before. Tolerance for this kind of activity has become thin. So when we came across this particular random campsite Sunday morning, Miles paid little attention to the time of day and proceeded to roust these one-time rowdy campers from their slumber. Try to get this place cleaned up. Get up, get out here, get her cleaned up now. Now. Get them on, get out. Time to get her cleaned up. Right now. In some instances, campers had already packed up and left the camping area, and once again, it's our conservation officers or others who are left holding the bag, or in this case, filling the bag. That's a site they've left. Birds have pulled all apart, so we're gonna have to clean it up because leave it till tomorrow, it's gonna be scattered even worse with uh, more birds into it, possibly bears, and then we'll have even more problems. Unfortunately, there are still people out there who don't think it's a big deal to abuse our public lands. It's to the point now where for the past eight years, a task force has been set up to try and contain the damage. A lot of folks seem a bit put out that we're there and making them clean up the garbage and that we're there to ruin the fun. You know, they, they don't really see an impact. You know, we're seeing stuff at one weekend, you know, a week ago, it was like, oh, this was, this was pretty nice. And then, oh my gosh, what happened here? This was only one weekend. This is, the damage we're seeing is not in, in, in the time frame of months or years, it's a, it's a weekend. So, you know, we're hoping that the message can get out there, but definitely it's, uh, it's a bit disheartening that, it, that it, it's not going as quick as we'd like it to. If the garbage issue isn't bad enough, the off-highway vehicles can make short work of sensitive habitat areas. If you look down the cut line there behind me, I don't know how many machines that might have been, but they came through there and uh, ruined a whole lot of uh, wetland. Some people say wetland's not important, but it's got a whole lot of uh, benefits for the ecosystem. Upwards of 40,000 people can be camped along these secondary highways during a long weekend. The majority don't cause an issue. Here's hoping the rest of them can start showing a little respect for our natural areas. Devon Energy has plans to help keep random campers safe this long weekend as their staff help educate those individuals on where or where not to pitch a tent or trailer. Random camping is becoming more and more popular, especially among those folks who own rigs too large for traditional campgrounds. Pipeline right-of-ways are a favorite location for many campers, but parking here comes with some risks. The hazards are the sour gas line and being close to a wellhead. We as a company try to be a good neighbor and basically as they come in on the May long weekend and hand out pamphlets and and uh, if somebody is camping on a pipeline or uh, beside a wellhead, we'll just stop and explain to them and being a little bit further away and explaining to them the dangers of being there. Most of them are very cooperative and a lot of them, you'll walk up to them and they, you're just going up to introduce yourself and they actually already know they've been around and they know yeah, that I'm far enough away and they're happy to see us coming out and just having that one-on-one that -on -one with them to let them know what's going on. Campers should allow for at least a 100 meter buffer around sour gas wells and facilities. Better still, use public campgrounds. Coming up, how your phone can help you call in moose sightings. Alberta Conservation Association. 
since 1997, more than $120 million has gone towards conserving wildlife and fish and securing habitat, creating a lasting legacy for Albertans. Right now, we're off to the University of Alberta to learn about an innovative approach to help keep track of moose numbers here in Alberta. Just how many moose are on the Alberta landscape? It's an important question that wildlife managers want to know. Now, there's an app for that. There. It's designed so that one hour after sunset, um, every day you're, you're prompted by the bellowing call of a cow moose in heat to, uh, to enter how many moose you've seen that day. You record how many hours you were in the field and how many, how many bulls, cows and calves you, you've seen. Next, hunters will hit the submit button. As soon as they get in range of a cell tower, the data will beam into Dr. Boyce's database here at the University of Alberta. With help from the IT department, he's developed a spreadsheet program to record the data. Several countries in Scandinavia have collected animal counts from hunters and found the numbers are very similar to aerial surveys done at the same time. Will the app replace the need for expensive aerial surveys? It can't replace aerial surveys in that aerial surveys are probably the gold standard for population estimation for, for moose. But aerial survey budgets are limited. So on average, each wildlife management unit in Alberta gets done once every 10 years. Using the app, hunters will provide moose counts every year. We need to convince hunters that it's in their interest to do a responsible job to assist game management in, in the province. Initially, the app will only be used to count moose, but in the future, that will likely be expanded to include fish and other species of wildlife. I think it's a no-brainer. We're going that direction. 40% of Albertans already own smartphones of some sort or another. Hunters will receive instruction on how to download the app when they purchase their moose tags. Northern Alberta is certainly an area moose call home. It's a landscape the moose must also share with oil and gas development. When bitumen is dug out of the ground, sand and clay comes with it. That sand and clay go into a tailings pond. No problem with the sand, it sinks to the bottom. But during the mining process, the fine clay particles get blown apart and don't want to join back together. Known as a mature fine tailings, they stay suspended in the water in a slurry. That's a big problem in reclaiming tailings ponds. The challenges that we have with those is really that the, the particles and, and the fine material in that stream can take decades and decades to settle. So we're talking 40, 50, 60 years um, before you're at a place where you can start to even think about reclamation. The new technology, the TRO technology, allows us to really do that in a number of weeks. TRO is the acronym for Tailings Reduction Operations. The water that contains the mature fine tailings is pumped out of the bottom of a pond into a process facility. A polymer is added and material is deposited on a beach. The polymer binds to the clay particles and joins them together. You get immediate separation of water and clay. The water drains off, leaving the clay to dry. What used to take 50 or 60 years now can happen in three weeks. Now reclamation can begin. This Suncor tailings pond is the first to be reclaimed in the oil sands. Today, oil sand companies are putting their heads together to come up with better reclamation technologies faster. We know that we don't have a monopoly on the good ideas. We know that when we bring our scientists and, and our technical folks together, they're much more powerful in terms of the ideas that they can develop and the solutions that they can deliver. By reducing the amount of time the clay particles stay suspended in the tailings pond, the more times this water can be recycled. You'll need less tailing ponds and less fresh water. We're very much focused on um, changing our operations, improving the way um, that we recycle water, improving efficiency in, in the amount of water that we use. And within Suncor, we've made some very public declarations about uh, how we want to reduce our, our fresh water intake from the Athabasca River. And we've made tremendous um, improvements year over year in that area. 
Currently, Suncor has eight tailings ponds at its mine. Its goal to shrink that to one, which will reduce the land area required for tailings ponds by 80%. Coming up, folks from across the province gather at Alfred Lake to celebrate Provincial Hunting Day. <laughs> yes! Wild Sheep Foundation Alberta promotes and enhances wild sheep populations and habitat through the funding of programs that support responsible wildlife management, conservation education, youth involvement, and the preservation of our hunting heritage. A rather special gathering of folks has been taking place at Alfred Lake over the past couple of years, celebrating Provincial Hunting Day. Alberta's history is rich in hunting-related activities. Hunting opportunities in many ways opened up our province not only to visitors, but helped pave the way for settlers to call Alberta home. This rich tradition was formally recognized five years ago when the provincial government declared a Provincial Hunting Day during the last Saturday in September. And that's where our story picks up. We're at Alfred Lake, home of the Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association Conservation Centre. Families from across the province have arrived to try their hand at a number of different activities. In many ways, this day is geared more toward the non-hunter or the individual interested in getting involved in hunting, as many of the demonstrations and activities provide an instruction to hunting techniques. From the intricacies of calling in wild game to how to safely handle and shoot firearms, there's no question the shotgun station has turned out to be one of the more popular activities, as our Elma discovered. I just want to make sure you do the fundamentals properly. The stance, gun always pointed down range. This figure is always up here when you're not shooting. Okay. You only put it on the trigger when, when you're, you're ready to shoot. Okay. Oh. Can it? Yeah. <laughs> that was so cool! So I just shot my very first shotgun and watching it on television does it absolutely no justice. You really have to experience it for yourself, hold that gun in your hand. And the first time that I shot it, my whole body was shaking, I could feel the weight of it. <laughs> What's kind of like a personal pleasure or joy that you gain from seeing somebody do this for the first time? Your initial reaction when you squeezed off yeah. that first round, that big smile and your eyes, you know, I love this, that, that's the thing. not think that I would hit a target. It really felt impossible. I got it. i never done that before. Amazing. Get a little bit quicker. One, two, down. Kathy, this is your first provincial hunting day. What have you thought of the, of the festivities here today? Oh, I've had a blast. I really like how they've got all the different things set up and it's really um, people friendly. They're definitely talking about safety first, which is important since we've got some pretty big guns here. Hey, right on. Indeed, safety is a priority with all the volunteers and participants. And with expert advice and instruction, anyone who has an interest in shooting is welcome to give it a shot. The hunting community has certainly rallied behind some great social programs. One particular event stands out called Shoot for Cause. Since 1996, archers have gathered here at Camp Hehoha, just west of Edmonton. They're here to help raise funds so that the camp can host Albertans with special needs over the upcoming summer. You know, it's a real blessing that we have all these archers out here this weekend. They're willing to go out in the community and gather some money prior to coming out on behalf of people with special needs in Alberta. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to provide a, a great shoot, a great venue. Um, you know, a fun family weekend, a competitive weekend, depending on what your outlook is on 3D archery. And, uh, and, and ultimately raise some money for camp and allow people less fortunate to get to, uh, to an outdoor recreational opportunity. Yes. yes! And it's a sentiment that's not lost on some of the younger participants. It means a lot because when, if they don't have the chance to shoot, they can experience it. Yeah, I'm glad that we're raising money for it, that we don't have to pay for it, so we just raise money. And I'm glad Greg's doing this because it's pretty nice for him to do it. 
Yes. The idea to incorporate a 3D shoot as a fundraiser was easy for Greg to come up with. Well, when I came out here in 1996, uh, I had been a bow hunter for, for quite a few years before I came out. And in addition to my bow hunting, I've been doing quite a bit of uh, 3D archery. And they were looking for a new fundraiser when I came on stream and automatically tied something that I love to do with, with something that potentially could raise some money. So that's where the concept of the 3D archery, uh, the archery event came from. The money raised by these dedicated hunters and archers over the course of the weekend will help subsidize about 760 campers this summer. Hi, I'm Brad Fenson with the Alberta Fish and Game Association and your Outdoor Tip of the Week. Anybody that enjoys the outdoors should have a good pair of binoculars. The key to using them and getting the most out of them is knowing how to set them up. All binoculars come with screw up eye caps. And those are for people that don't wear eyeglasses, you want those up so that you have the proper eye relief to the first lens in your binocular. The second most important thing for maximum clarity is to use the different focus rings. What you want to do is pick a, a very clear, precise object out about 25 to 50 meters and focus in on it. What you'll do is you'll close your right eye and use the center dial ring to focus the left barrel. When you get a perfectly clear image, you just repeat the process. You close your left eye, get the binoculars up, and then you turn this diopter ring until the right barrel comes crystal clear. You can then lock it in place so that it'll never move. It'll always be set up for your eyes properly. And anytime you want to look at something, you lift it up, and all you have to do is use the center ring and dial things in for a crisp, clear image. Now, some binoculars have the diopter ring on the center as well. The main focus ring is here and the diopter ring is set the same way. So once you set up your binoculars properly with proper eye relief, your diopter setting calibrated properly and use your focus ring, you'll be able to bring those outdoor images in crisp and clear no matter what you're doing. Coming up, my co-host Alma will join me in studio to chat about our upcoming season two. Canada's cold water resources need you. Trout Unlimited Canada delivers conservation results for our freshwater ecosystems and their cold water resources. Our work includes stream restoration, scientific research and education through our Yellowfish Road program. As we saw earlier, hunters are doing their part to help provide an opportunity for a special group of folks to enjoy the outdoors. Alberta Parks has the same philosophy. What do I say? Hi, Mom. Are you excited? <laughs> excited about going for a chair ride? Yeah. Okay. Right, you let me know when you're getting tired of it, and then I'll okay. give you. The goal of Alberta's Parks Push to Open program is that everyone has the support they need to be fully included in nature. Go to your left a bit. For Kara, that means that she's now able to go down a path through the forest near Drayton Valley. It's called a trail rider and it's just one of the many things that allow us to modify the user, not the environment, to make it possible for people to do different sorts of things. The trail rider in particular has actually been up to Mount Kilimanjaro and to the base camp of Mount Everest. I feel like it's getting away from yeah. you guys. Yeah. Just let me know and I'll break. And it just shows that with some determination and teamwork and a big fat wheel, you can get almost anywhere. In the back you're just concerned about balance and then keeping your hand close to the brake if you start going down a good downhill. The person driving it is Kara though. She's the one in charge. She tells us when we're going too fast, tells us if she's not feeling safe or not feeling comfortable. It's all about teamwork within the team. And the person in the trail rider is as much part of the team as anyone else. Shelly is the other trail rider and she's the first to arrive at a large obstacle, a large spruce tree that's blocking the path. Can't go over it. Just Can't go you. under it. <laughs> Gotta go through it. <laughs> okay, you guys want to put it down and we'll take a look and we'll scout. After checking it over, the decision is made to turn back. All right. Side step right, side step right. There Here we go. go. Round, 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 and round we go. Volunteers are a key component of making a trip like this possible, and it seems that they're enjoying this trip out in nature as much as Kara and Shelley. We've got a community of people that are very dedicated, very hardworking, absolutely love this program, absolutely love what they do, come out year after year and are there to just pretty much do whatever it takes to make things happen. It gives people a place where they can belong, where they can say, 
I was out there for the weekend and people weren't pushing me out of their way. People weren't asking me if I was okay or overlooking me. They actually made me feel like a part of this experience. So parks in that regard are becoming this really interesting community builder. Okay. Hey Colton, take it easy, eh? Seat belts. While some were trail riding, others chose to go quadding at Blue Rapids Provincial Recreation Area. But with the side-by-side -side now, with a five-point harness like race car drivers, uh, basically you can tie a person in there in a very safe manner. We saw you come in through that mud hole and, and the, the looks on all, all of your participants' faces said it all. So that's basically what we do it. It's just to see the faces and, 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 uh, and it's a memory for them to have for, for years and years and years to come. We've learned about a term among the disability community called a TAB and a TAB is temporarily able-bodied because disability affects every one of us. At some point in our life, we're gonna face barriers either because we're, we're elderly or we're injured or we're pushing a baby stroller. And so what we're finding is people get educated to realize, you know what, that person faces those barriers, but I'll face those barriers someday. So it's really, it is about all of us. Official Tim Shot, are we ready? Oh, oh, yay for Chili! Everyone wraps up their day by sharing their favorite moment. Going down the trail that hadn't been broken yet and taking some pictures off the ridge, that was the highlight. It was awesome. Riding three times and going over the same puddle three times at the end. Yeah, that puddle was bigger and bigger and bigger. Hey, Nick. Getting muddy. Getting muddy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and you did a very good job of that. Yeah. Yep. Well, after a busy day outdoors, it's a roaring campfire and people sharing their outdoor adventures. That's what the Push to Open program is all about. Proof positive that everybody, regardless of your ability, belongs outside. The Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association delivers conservation programs about Alberta's wildlife and fish which need to be managed for future generations. To date, AHIA has instructed over one million students. Alberta Conservation Association. Since 1997, more than $120 million has gone towards conserving wildlife and fish and securing habitat creating a lasting legacy for Albertans. Well, look who's here. Alma, so great to see you. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. Hard to believe that we've come to an end of our first season, Alma. Looking back, what have been your favorite moments on Let's Go Outdoors? Well, just about anything that got me out of the city, Michael. <laughs> but really, spending that weekend winter camping, that was certainly a milestone for me. As well, having an opportunity to unearth a dinosaur bone dating back millions of years and being the first person to see it, that was such a neat experience for me. You know, that's a great word, Alma, experience, because it's something we want to highlight that all our adventures are something anyone can do. And looking into season two, there are a couple of fun ones right off the bat. Indeed, we are going to be in the Spray Lakes area learning all about sled dogs, and I'm even gonna give driving one of the sleds a try. You won't wanna miss that. Stop your feet. And then we head up to Johnson Canyon for a winter hike wow. and learn some pretty cool facts about ice yeah, and how it helps beautiful. shape this impressive canyon. You know, just talking about all this stuff has got me ready to go out there again. Well, you won't have too long to wait, Alma. We've got a busy summer ahead as we start to collect some new stories to share with everyone next season. Right now, though, would you like to do the honors? Of course. If you would like to catch previous stories featured on Let's Go Outdoors, then track down our website at letsgooutdoors.ca. And remember, the outdoors is here for all of us to enjoy. If you see someone taking away from that enjoyment, call the Report a Poacher line. Till next time, I'm Elma Mehmed Begovic. And I'm Michael Short. Till next season, everyone, let's go outdoors. Good job. I know where I want to be Outside, wild and free Let's go outdoors Let's go outdoors You and me Let's go outdoors Where the waters run clear and cold Mother Nature's world is better than gold to see so much to do let's go
outdoors. 